Hello, my name is Pam Bartha, and I'm really excited to spend this time with you today talking about how multiple sclerosis um, can be helped, our recovery can be helped by using antihistamines. And of course, all the talks that I share with you, all the videos that I share are for educational purposes only. So they're not intended to replace the necessary measures of your healthcare provider. What I'm going to be sharing with you today is something that has been kind of unfolding over the past week or so with me. And it's a huge insight. I know I was going to talk about a different topic, but I decided to talk about this topic because it's really, really significant for multiple sclerosis. So if you're just joining me, my name is Pam Bartha, and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And I'm very excited to spend this time with you talking about how antihistamines can help in our recovery of multiple sclerosis. So these insights I'm going to share with you, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey back to when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. But before I do that, I just want to share with you that there has been some research just in 2016, 2017, that was published. And they were talking about how when they're putting people on antihistamines, a specific one, and it's a little bit higher doses than are normally recommended, that they're actually finding that there is repair in the myelin. And this is people that are, they were just looking at optic neuritis cases, like ongoing optic neuritis. And they were finding that there was actually myelin repair going on. And that's very different from the disease modifying drugs that we're used to because they are more suppressing our immune system and trying to slow down the progression, but not really seeing any repair. So this is a really significant finding. Now, how could this be possible? How could it be that an antihistamine might help us have some repairing to the myelin nerve, the optic nerve? So, what I'd first like to do is say a quick hello to a few people that are joining. I want to make sure that you can hear me. Hello. Um, Zeta and Dawn and Maureen and uh, there we go. There's some comments here, Victor and Kim, Zuditu, Judith. So there's a few people joining us right now and what I'd like you to do is just type in your comments and type in your questions and please share this because this is going to be really significant. It's just another piece of the puzzle. And remember that everything I share with you is for educational purposes. So it's important to understand that I don't want you guys to run out and grab some antihistamines and start taking a bunch because number one, this is not a cure. I'm gonna explain why it is helpful. And then also, there are some people that are on certain disease modifying drugs that are not gonna have the same benefit while taking this. According to Dr. Mass, who's a neurologist, and she's worked with a lot of people that suffer with multiple sclerosis. So Bearing all that in mind, it's going to be piecing this together. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1988. I was just 28 years old. The very first symptom I had was severe optic neuritis. I lost all vision in my left eye. It was like a black patch for several weeks. I did get tingling and weakness in my legs. I had terrible in, um, headaches, terrible fatigue, really bad insomnia. I could not sleep. I was just overtired but wired. I don't know if any of you can relate. I know that a lot of the students I work with, they do have a lot of insomnia. Some people have a hard time falling asleep, but some people wake up in the middle of the night and they can't go back to sleep. That's a very common symptom with multiple sclerosis. So I was in this position where I had two young kids and I had this blackout of my left eye and I was so tired and sick. My mom stepped in to help me. And I did go to the experts and the, the MS, it's a university MS clinic on our West Coast in Canada. And there he said, yes, you have multiple sclerosis. There's nothing you can do. You're going to be completely disabled in time. And I really did not like what he had to say. I'd never been sick in my life. I was a healthy person. I'm like, how can this happen? This is like this mysterious thing taking over my body. So very shortly after that, um, before I learned about infections, just I would say, you know, three to four months later, I have a friend who's a physiotherapist, a senior physiotherapist, and he kind of took me under his wing. He didn't know, like, of course, he helped people with multiple sclerosis, right? With physiotherapists, they do that. But he didn't know much about anything else as far as integrative, because this was in 1988. There really was not a lot available. We didn't really have the computers. I didn't have a computer. So 
somehow, and I'm not sure how, but he found this Dr. Maas, M-A-A-S, in Holland, in the Netherlands. And this doctor, and her, it's a mother and daughter, they're both neurologists, and I'm, I'm sure they both had multiple sclerosis, and their practice, they worked with a lot of people that have multiple, have multiple sclerosis. I'm not sure if they're still practicing now. So remember, this was back in 1989, which is almost 30 years ago. What they had discovered back in that day, that this is what they felt, is that multiple sclerosis was caused by sensitivities, like allergy type food sensitivities, etc. And if you avoided certain things and you took antihistamines, it could really manage the disease. So first of all, she said, get rid of all caffeine, all cocoa, coffee, tea, anything that has caffeine in it. So I did that right away. And I noticed that the tingling in my legs that was constant, within two days, it subsided. So I would still get a little bit of tingling here and there, but it was not a constant strong tingle. The next thing that she mentioned is that, you know, if people come to her that have multiple sclerosis, what she will have them do is go on an antihistamine. And back in the day, she recommended polaramine, which is a very plain Jane antihistamine. Just excuse me, I'm going to grab a drink of water. So I went on the antihistamine, and what I found within a couple of days, actually not a couple of days, the first day, I noticed that I could sleep. And that was a really big deal, because if you're having a lot of insomnia, it almost feeds itself and it becomes worse. <coughs> Have a little tickle. So that was a really big deal for me because once I started sleeping, I started feeling a lot better. So I just kind of thought that the antihistamine was helping me to sleep. So she recommended to take it um, at night and during the day to take a moderate amount of the antihistamine for a few weeks, right? For I think it was about six weeks. So I started doing that and I found that that wired, overtired feeling started to settle down and I started to feel peaceful and I could sleep. So that was a really big deal. Because she talked about all these allergies, I started to find a naturopath and start to look at allergies, food allergies and do desensitizing and all of that. And I found that that didn't help me a lot. But the antihistamine helped me a lot. So from that point on, I basically shelved the antihistamine part because I started to move on to learning about infections. I actually, before I even started infections, I did the allergies and the desensitizing. They didn't help a lot. It was very expensive to keep getting tested and retested and doing a lot of desensitizing. Then I found, um, actually the naturopath recommended the, Roy, the uh, low fat, yeah, the low fat diet by Dr. Swank, and I tried that, and I didn't really notice any difference, and then I started to find the yeast connection, and that's when my mother-in-law gave me that book called uh, The Yeast Connection by Dr. William Crook, and in that book, he talked about infections, so that's where I started to, you know, start to follow kind of more of a candida diet, like this was, <laughs> I was just fumbling my way along, so following the candida diet, bringing in nice statin and starting and I started to feel a lot better then. I started to really notice improvements by knocking back yeast. I didn't understand the huge part of parasites. So I right now I'm coaching people for the past I would say seven, eight years in a larger group setting, wellness champions all over the world. And some of you are on this call right now and some of you have never met me before. And so what I learned early on is that my symptoms were caused by infection. And back 30 years ago, those doctors, they understood fungus and yes, parasites, but we really didn't understand how significant parasites are with multiple sclerosis. But so what I found is originally we were, you know, knocking back yeast and fungus and then Lyme disease kind of stepped into the limelight and really understanding that Borrelia can play a part and the co-infections. This past year, working with my students, we've really come to understand that parasites are a huge problem with chronic disease, multiple sclerosis and other. And I'm talking big and small parasites. So if you follow my work, if you've watched any of my YouTube videos, you will see that I have a five-part series on multiple sclerosis and infection. And I have a great page with a whole bunch of peer-reviewed science that shows 
fungal like studies showing that people with MS, they're finding fungus in their brain cells, in their spinal fluid, in their uh, blood. They're also finding nematodes, these little parasitic worms in the central nervous system, especially in the spinal fluid. And then what I'm see, I've been seeing in the last few months in my students is we finally have gotten way better at finding a way to, to release these large parasitic worms that we're dealing with. And I'm telling you, my students are passing up to 12 inch worms. And if you want to kind of look and see, and this is pretty much the norm with multiple sclerosis. So if you'd like to see what that is like, watch my video from last week, which is called multiple sclerosis and parasitic worms, or I think it's MS and parasitic worms. I'm telling you all of this to help you to pull all these pieces together because, you know, this is a 29 year journey for me. And it's crazy how the very, very first thing that I learned was that antihistamines could play a small part as far as I thought it was just insomnia and just settling the immune system down. I had no idea the ramifications of what I'm going to be pulling together here for you right now. So remember that I said that there's new research and I don't know why it hasn't received more popularity, more attention, but just in 2017, there, this was published in The Lancet, that they're finding that giving um, people this antihistamine, that they actually are seeing myelin repair, all right? So we're kind of going back to why is that the case? So knowing that my students are infested with parasites, and that's when you look at the pictures, I just showed you a few pictures and remember to go back onto my old video to watch it. So I know because I've been working with hundreds of people and I see what they're passing, a lot more pictures than that. I know that they're infested with worms. Those are the big ones we can see. But what about the little ones, those little nematodes that do get into the central nervous system? So we know that we have a lot of parasites for sure. And there is a study. So with my students that have terrible insomnia, they're not able to fall asleep at night or they wake up through the night. And we know that parasites produce a lot of chemicals, right? They produce things like morphine type substances and ammonia and amphetamines. So at night when we're going to bed, they're more active and they often wake us up at like three o'clock in the morning. Like I don't know if some of you guys wake up at three o'clock roughly that time and you have a hard time going to back to sleep. Well, if we end up with too many, and this has been documented by doctors that I've listened to their talks, that if, we, if they're producing a lot of these chemicals and our liver's not cleaning up the mess fast enough, then it can wake us up and we don't fall asleep. And thank you so much for interacting with me for all the love. I really appreciate it because I can't see your beautiful faces and it really means a lot to me that I can at least see some hearts and thumbs up. So please share this and uh, like it and all of your love is great. All right. So when you, what I found, which uh, this, this is another piece of the puzzle. This just came to me last week. So I found this article that says that antihistamines can be helpful in treating worms because they sedate them. Interesting, right? Because they sedate us a little bit when we take them. We're taking them to relieve allergies. But we do know that we can take Benadryl to help us sleep at night. And so when we're taking the Benadryl, could it be that they are sedating these parasitic worms, especially the bigger ones, we would definitely notice a big difference. And if they're sedated, they're not going to be as active and then we can sleep a lot better. I really believe that is super huge. And this is going to play into even more. So when you're taking, if you can't sleep, if you have chronic disease and you've been watching my videos and you're horrified by all those worms and you're pretty certain that you have them, especially looking at the symptoms, then that that could be one of the reasons why it's helping you to sleep because it is sedating the worms. This has really huge implications because when if we have these nematodes in the central nervous system, which Dr. Alan McDonald has found in 10 out of 10 brain samples that he's looked at the central nervous system of people that have died of MS. And if we want to kill those out of our central nervous system, one concern is that, well, if you kill them too fast, you might get this Herx reaction in your central nervous system and it could be fatal. 
it could be so strong and cause seizures, etc. So if we would sedate, this is this is all coming like to research it, but if we could sedate these worms, then maybe we would not herx, right? And maybe we would not have as much. So this is the kind of groundbreaking work that we're doing with our students and working with healthcare providers. So we are literally providing this information to healthcare providers that are helping our students, the studies, the parasite pictures, the protocols, because most doctors don't know this yet. So this is a really big deal. So instead of taking prednisone, which suppresses our immune system, maybe we could take antihistamines that would sedate the worms, making them easier to treat, all right, as we're treating them. Because we do know that they are tough to treat. And we do know that when I'm working with students that some of them are so sensitive to everything when they start. They want to, you know, they get to the killing plate. Remember, we have to start with the eating plan. We've got to stop feeding them. We support the body in various ways. We start to look at the symptoms that they have. And by that time, we're ready to start building the game plan to start killing. And some people, even single herbs, it, they really react. And it's kind of like an angry worm syndrome. It's like if you're taking a supplement or a killing agent that doesn't quite kill them but irritates them, people's symptoms can get stronger. And I know that some of you, this might be really new, then you need to go back and look at those parasite pictures that I did last week. So the video after this, go and watch. It's called um, multiple MS and parasitic worms. And you'll see what the students are passing. And when you see how big they are, you understand why they feel so lousy and why you feel so lousy. All right, so if we can sedate them and treat them so that they're not giving us as much Herxheimer's reaction, I think that's gonna be really valuable, all right? And then, so that's another piece of the puzzle that I found just this last week about how the antihistamines can be useful in sedating parasitic worms in their treatment. Now the final piece of the puzzle, just another study that I found just recently, uh, actually just a day or so ago, I just want to pull it up here, but basically they're finding that, okay, this was an animal study. They took some, they took two sets of mice, I believe, mice or rats, mice, and they infected them with parasitic worms, all right? And then they gave one set of mice antihistamines and the other set of mice, they did not give them antihistamines. And they found that the, the mice that had the antihistamines, they had four times more eosinophils. And eosinophils are your soldiers, your immune system, like, like the white blood cells are part of your immune system that treats and parasites. And in the mice that did not get the antihistamines, they they were not able to clear the worms. Like they were, um, and I'll read this to you here because it's really, really huge. So they found that the clearance of the worms was dependent on the amount of eosinophils. So like when we get infected with parasitic worms, the eosinophils go there and they start to destroy them. But the problem is, is that when you have a lot of parasites, you can end up with a lot of histamines and then the histamines will cause a decrease in your eosinophils. So this is just one of the ways that these microbes, these infections can cause immune dysfunction in our body. If you've been following my work, I've shared with you the work of Dr. Alex Vasquez, who's pulled together at least 14 different ways that these infectious pathogens, bacteria also, but fungus, and they all have different ways to trick our immune system to perpetuate themselves in our body. So when we have a lot of parasitic worms, or the mice, and they're mammals and we're mammals, so it's probably very likely it's the same. So when we have a lot of parasitic worms, we should have higher levels of eosinophils in our blood work, but we're not seeing that. And it could be that we're dealing a lot of us. And remember that I'm not painting a picture for everyone because we all have different levels of infections, but I'm telling you that parasitic worms are a very big part of multiple sclerosis. I've seen that in many, many students and we're, this has just been at like a, this year has been huge. So this is coming. So, and they also had mice that were, they didn't have eosinophils. I don't know how they do that, but basically they would give them the antihistamines. And so those mice did not recover, 
right? So they said that the recovery of these mice being able to, um, their eosinophils, their immune system to be able to treat the worms in them was dependent on having the antihistamine to lower the histamines in their body to allow the eosinophils to increase in population to treat the infections, the parasites. So that's really, really huge. So could it be that antihistamines have very different helpful roles? Number one, maybe they will be sedating the bigger micro parasites and maybe even the small ones in our central nervous system, I don't know. But if they're sedating us, then I'm sure they're sedating the worms. So that's a really big thing. So that could help as we're treating them, especially when we're considering the central nervous system. If we want to get those nematodes, not just the big ones in our intestines, but the nematodes, the little ones in our central nervous system that are really linked to a lot of MS symptoms. And then number two, if we do take antihistamines, is there a benefit in helping our immune system to produce the eosinophils that are needed to help our immune system fight these parasitic infections, especially those little ones in the central nervous system. Really, really huge, really huge. I, I, I was so excited and that's why I had to share all of this with you. So I help people to build that plan to be able to treat those infections and I can see that the antihistamines can be really helpful. Now I just wanna caution you always that it's really important to work with somebody, right? Don't just go and buy a bunch of antihistamines and dope yourself up. Number one, there may be interactions with some of the medications you're on. Um, and then two, um, it's very important to make sure that you, let's say what Dr. Mass said is that if you're doing any beta interferon or interferon uh, disease modifying drugs, that they, it doesn't really work with it, all right? It, you're not gonna see the same benefits. So, you really need to work with somebody with this. But I will keep you posted as we learn more and more with the wellness champions. But um, it's really exciting, really super, super exciting. All right, I'm gonna go to your questions. All right, so there are 56 comments, here we go. <laughs> okay, so there's gotta be something specific in the composition of, those, of the antihistamine, yes. Well, it's basically that the antihistamine is blocking the amount of histamine. So probably likely is that we have a higher level of histamines, which we do when we have parasitic, certain parasitic infections. And so the higher histamine in our body is causing us to have lower amounts of eosinophils. And those are the microbes that would, not microbes, those are the immune cells that treat the parasites that kill the parasitic worms inside of us. And it's that simple. It's not that difficult, I'm sure. So Debbie, you read an article saying that low carb ketogenic diet can cause kidney stones and constipation. I guess the, the big thing that you have to, two issues. So what, I guess the thing is you have to really, um, know where you're getting your information from. There is, that's the hard thing for people. There is so much information on the internet. It's, you know, everybody has an opinion. And all I can share with you is that the eating plan we're following is not the ketogenic eating plan. So if you're following that, you know, all I can say is I know that there have been a lot of children that have had epilepsy and it's really helped them better than medication to have no more seizures. It's huge for cancer. It's huge for, so it's, it's a really big thing. So you really have to, if you're having the kidney stones, it is likely part of the, con, like the constipation for sure. And the kidney stones are all part of the infection for sure. That's what we see with chronic disease. So it has nothing to do with the eating plan. And does onions and garlic play a good role in fighting against parasites? You know, that's a tough thing is that the students that I work with that are not really disabled, maybe they've had multiple sclerosis or chronic disease for less years, they're still you know, able to walk, um, struggling but dealing with symptoms for sure. The ones that are in the wheelchair that are really disabled, they've had the parasites for much longer, there's more damage, 
And so we're seeing that sometimes it can be much more helpful even with the antiparasitic drugs, especially when you want to reach the parasites in the central nervous system. So onions and garlic are really healthy foods. Definitely eat them, but they are not going to even touch. We even see some of our students using a really good blend of antiparasitic herbs for two or three weeks, not passing anything, and then adding in other like the different types of oxygen therapies and even antiparasitic pharmaceuticals, and then they're passing a lot of worms. So it's really important that, I would say that the biggest problem that people have is that they're, they're not treating the infections effectively enough, right? They're, they're trying things, but the thing is that if you're taking a treatment, working with somebody, and if you're not noticing small improvements, even within, let's say, a week, just small improvements, then you're not doing the right things. It's really important and you need to adjust it and you need to be working with someone and you need to correct it. So don't just keep taking a certain herb or a certain thing, hoping that it's going to change things. And if nothing's changing, it's not going to. If you're using the right treatment, you should be starting to see tiny symptom improvements week by week or amazing symptom, but you should be noticing symptom improvements. And so Rob, you only sleep about six hours a day. When we're sleep deprived, it actually makes these infections stronger because our immune system is actually weaker. So it's very, very important that you get at least eight hours of sleep. It's kind of like a bank account. You really have to make sure you get enough sleep. Otherwise, it will promote these infections and it will make the disease stronger and make us disabled quicker. So Tina, you'd love more information. So what I would do is watch my master class training. Oh, I, that's what I wanted to share with you is next week, I'm going to be hosting a live master class training. I only do that three times a year. This is the last one before we go into uh, the end of the year here. So Wednesday at five o'clock, it won't be here. It will not be on Facebook. If you want to join us, you have to register. And so all you do is you just, uh, we have a link in this video where you can register, you just click on it, you put in your, ne your name and your email, you'll get all the details, and you'll be able to join me live next Wednesday at five o'clock. And the masterclass training is called How to Recover from Multiple Sclerosis Naturally. So hello, Lynette. So you have terrible insomnia as well? Absolutely. <coughs> so how long do you take antihistamines for, and what is the best vitamin to get rid of the worms? Vitamins will not get rid of the worms, unfortunately. And the best histamine, antihistamine, I can't give medical advice on this call. You need to work with someone. You need to work with a doctor. You can work with us. We have a class called the Live Disease Free Academy. If you listen to my master class training, you can join us. And that way you can get the right information. But it just self-diagnosing and self-prescribing yourself is not going to work i promise you and it's kind of dangerous also i mean if you can't sleep you can go to the drugstore and you can get benadryl um, plain jane benadryl and that will help you sleep but make sure that you talk to your pharmacist and your doctor because if you're on certain medications there can be interactions maybe you have certain condition you can't just take medication without being careful and i know that's another thing I want to share too, is that with multiple sclerosis, we don't all have exactly the same infections, the same amounts of each infection. Generally, yes, we have parasites and yes, we have fungus and yes, we have bacterial infections. But somebody with MS and diabetes might have more fungus. They have the parasites, but the fungus might be in the forefront and causing the biggest symptoms. So then if you go on an antihistamine, it might not benefit, benefit you as well. Like you might notice that it's not really helping with symptoms and maybe it's kind of bothering you more. So this is where it's important to work with someone and it's important, then you understand why you have to switch things and what you should be doing. Treating these parasites and infections is a lot of, it, it takes strategy. It's not a simple thing to do and that's why it's really important to work with somebody. If you want your life back, if you want to beat this, so Dana, you shared, this is fascinating. It really is, Dana. I'm super excited. I know that this is going to be huge. And it's funny because when I was first diagnosed my, and I went on the antihistamines, like my mom, like 
she's from Holland too. And, and when she read about Dr. Mass and she's like, she was so excited and she really thought it helped me a lot. And it did, it really stabilized me. Right. Cause I wasn't sleeping. I was kind of crashing and burning. So it helped me to sleep and felt, I felt more peaceful, but then I kind of dropped it. Cause I'm like, mom, you know, eventually I could sleep and I was treating infections and getting better. And she's like, no, no, no. You've got to tell your students about antihistamines. There's, there's, they were so helpful for you. And I'm like, mom, yes, but they're just to help you to sleep. And now, like, I'm eating crow, right? But now I see that with this, all this research, connecting all these dots together, how it could possibly help our immune system to fight the parasites and how it sedates the worms, right? So that we could treat some of these critters a lot easier with less herxing. It's super exciting. And I have to give my mom all the credit for that, for sure. All right. So... Seda, oh my gosh, 10 out of 10. <laughs> yes, I know, that's really huge. And if you want to learn more about those parasitic nematodes, it's called cerebral spinal nematodiasis. There's a really good video that Dr. Alan McDonald did on YouTube. I talk about it in my five-part series of infections, talking about all the different types of infections, but you can just go onto YouTube and just type in Dr. Alan McDonald and um, MS, and you'll see it. And it is about, you'll see that he's talking about the nematodes. And he, he shows pictures of them. You're so welcome, Don and Allison and Sherry. So what is the best antihistamine to take? So back in the day, I took polaramine. And it is a very plain Jane simple antihistamine. So you want to get something that's very, not a lot of other things added into it. And what I liked about it is I could get it in two milligram, two milligram tablets. So I followed her advice with taking a higher amount at the start, but then I could work my way down and work off of it. So I let, that's what I use, but unfortunately it's not available in Canada. It might be available in um, the United States, in different parts of the world, but for some reason it's not available in Canada. So it's not that that's the only one that you can use. I'm sure basically what it is is that the important thing is that it is a uh, histamine, one recept, histamine one receptor blockade. So it's kind of blocking this histamine one receptor, right? Whatever antihistamine you're using. But of course you want to, and you know, I'll be sharing more and more information um, as I get my hands on that study to just see how much they were giving these people the antihistamines, they were giving them higher amounts than normal and finding that there was actually myelin repair. So if you think about it, if there were these little nematodes present, right, that we find with multiple sclerosis, which also can be present in the eye, they like to hang out there and in the central nervous system. What I believe is happening is that we've gone on antibiotics too many times, we're really out of balance, we pick up these little nematodes. They're from all kinds of domestic animals and probably all over the place. And they start to grow in our gut and they become more populated in the gut. They spill over into the blood. We've seen pictures. Um, this beautiful student from Europe sent me pictures. She's a medical student. She has MS and another person has MS seeing these little tiny little nematode worms in the blood of MS patients. And then over time, they cross the blood-brain barrier. They can get into the eyes also. So that's probably why with, multi with uh, giving people that have optic neuritis, they probably have these parasites in their eye causing the optic neuritis. And if you give them high amounts of the antihistamine, it's completely sedating them. And maybe it's lethal if it's too much for them. I don't know, but it's helping. It looks like it's helping the myelin to repair itself, which is unlike any MS drug. So that's really huge. But remember that there's a lot of things, a lot of parts to this, but it's, it's exciting. So remember the antihistamine is not going to kill the worms, but it is going to sedate them. It's going to slow them down. Um, and it's going to be very helpful. And also as we're treating them, we may end up with less, less Herxheimer's reactions. So Robin, you have terrible insomnia. It's really important in recovery. You have to do whatever it takes. So Robin, I know you're one of the new students and they're in the members area for the academy. Make sure to go to the um, Sleep Like a Baby resource. I've got a lot of different things listed there. And 
It's super important for recovery. Those are one of the first things we do in supporting the body before we start killing is we want to make sure we're sleeping. All right. And Jan, hello. Hi, Stephen. And you wake up in the middle of the night with spasms. So that's another thing. And it is really important, like if you haven't done that already, take all caffeine out of your diet because that is, that's what I wanted to share with you. It's really, this is what I'm thinking. So if we have all these parasitic worms, right? We know that when we're drinking caffeine and we're having, you know, like coffee and tea and chocolate, we're getting caffeine in our system, it kind of makes us wired. Well, just think about these tiny, tiny little worms that are way smaller than us and they're getting wired, right? So they, if they're wired, they're going to be more of a nuisance in us. So that could be, it, it may not even be that we're sensitive to it. It could easily be that it's just aggravating these parasites, right? And I really believe that because we are infested with different types of infections, especially the, uh, the parasites. Um, and now you've got me scared. <laughs> that's all right. When you see them, it's exciting because then you know it's like, oh my gosh, that's why I feel so horrible. That makes so much sense. Hello, Tom. Hello, Lisa May. And Robin and Oksana. Antoinette, what type of blood test is needed to find infection? That's the really big challenge, Antoinette, is that you can do a comprehensive stool analysis for $500 and it'll come back false negative. You can just do a stool test and you might find something like blastocystis hominis, some little parasitic, but it's going to miss all of the ones that are causing you grief. They will not pick up the nematodes in your central nervous system. They will not pick up these big, like very rarely will they ever pick up these big, big round worms, tapeworms, etc. So what's really important is to go by symptoms. That's what we do first. Like in our program, we remember we First, stop feeding them, support the body, then we start looking at your symptoms. And there are very specific symptoms for parasites. There are very specific symptoms for fungus. There are very specific symptoms for bacteria. And when you see that, you're like, oh my goodness, I had no idea that I could have that many parasites. And then you start to treat them. And then they start to come out. And then it's like, you know, at the beginning, people could be squeamish, but it's like, you want them out of you, for sure. All right, so I'm seeing if uh, I think that is it for the questions. I'll just go. So Debbie, you definitely have candida. We know that fungus is always present with chronic disease. And candida is just one of the types of fungus that can be involved. And remember, there could be 20 different types of or more types of candida. Yeah, they are terrible worms. So Linda, you just popped on. This is interesting. My sister has MS. You wish you would have known this. You know what? This past weekend, I went into my filing cabinet and I pulled out an old file and I didn't know that I documented so many things so clearly. So I really documented like what I was doing and what I started. And if I would have known even what Dr. Mass said, like earlier, I could have hit it so hard and I wouldn't have had the damage with the optic neuritis. Luckily, I was able to focus on treating infections and I was able to, you know, stop the MS. But if I would have known early on, then I could have done the antihistamines and I may have been able to save my left eye vision because with my left eye, I cannot, it's not functional for driving. It was that brutal. So it's the optic nerve behind the eye that was so fried. And what another thing that I just wanted to share with you that is so fascinating is that when we were corresponding with her, a lot of the, the material I got from her was in Dutch because my friend who's the physiotherapist is Dutch also. So they would correspond and so they have to translate it for me. But back in 1989, she had about 12 neurologists in her area, like in, in Holland that were following her protocols. And also she had been published in at least one journal article in the annals of, uh, where is that here? Um, where is that? So she had an article published in the Medical Extra in July 1986 and MS and Coco article in the peer-reviewed journal Annals of Allergies in July 1987. So she was already having 
a lot of GPs and quite a number of neurologists following her protocol back in the day where they were taking out the caffeine and they were using the antihistamines. And so what she said is that if people were having an attack, of course, you know, you, she wanted to train and have the doctors train people how to use the antihistamines. But if they were having an attack to know that they were supposed to use a higher amount of antihistamines for a couple, three days and, and not to wait to try to get into a doctor's office because that would help to settle it down. And if they waited for two or three days, it would be too late and they'd have a lot more damage to the myelin sheath. So really interesting. Time is going to tell if this could be really helpful for MS. And I'm not prescribing, I'm not recommending any specific ones because I'm not a doctor, right? But this is something that is it's going to be unfolding. And as we have more experience with this, we'll be sharing it. Really, really exciting. And then what she would also say too is that you know, once the attack settled down, then she would also get them to say, okay, what did you do different last week? What did you eat different? Was it high stress? Was it that you had a ton of sugar? And to help them figure out. And just by monitoring, like taking out the foods that they were sensitive to, she found that it could really slow down the progression of the multiple sclerosis. Remember, we're at a different place now. We want to treat those parasites. We want to get them out. But it's amazing what she was doing 30 years ago. Amazing. All right, so Maureen, you are in Ottawa next month. Yes, you need to get back. Yes, for sure. So wow, you just popped on and hello, Sherith. And hello, Cheryl. Um, also, you have been in the program for three days and you slept so deeply last night. So probably, so make sure that you're brand new. So make sure that you're following the eating plan, get my feedback. And then what you need to do next is support the body, go through the checklist for healing. And then we're going to start to look at your symptoms and start to build a game plan. I'm excited for you. This is going to be a wonderful Christmas for you. So hello, Benjamin. Could vaping marijuana help you with sleep or would it just make matters work a long time? That's a really good question. I do understand that marijuana is a medicinal plant. It's medicine, right? So we always have to look at the benefits and risks of medicine. So the benefits is that it is antimicrobial and that it does help people sleep and it does give pain relief. But the negative part of it is that it can really affect, affect our brain if we use it regularly for a, an extended period of time. There's a lot of good research coming out of Holland and Italy and one other country. Um, there's a documentary you can watch, it's called Messing With Heads. And it shows that people that use marijuana regularly, that it really can lead to higher incidence of depression and schizophrenia and bipolar or manic. So for me, in the live disease free system that we're using it's all about having the highest level of health to have the highest level of health you have to treat the cause which is infections and yes heavy metals and yes environmental toxins we do a holistic approach but the biggest reason why we're dealing with all these symptoms is infections the fungus the parasites and yes it can be brillia and other bacterial infections involved so I don't recommend marijuana. Um, there are lots of other ways that people can do pain management and sleep that I'm not, that to me would be safer in the long run. So that's how I am. I'm always about safety first and the best possible outcome with the least adverse effects. I have talked to some really great herbalists that are in marijuana dispensers and they are these uh, dispensaries. They said that if somebody is suffering with depression, they should not use marijuana um, or any type of psychosis. So that tells me also, right, that that's probably not the best, the, the most ideal thing to use for sure. And hi, Yvonne. So back in the early 90s, you had so many yeast infections. Does that play? Absolutely. And you're going to be you're just starting, I know, and you're going to be killing that, knocking back the yeast. That will be a big part of it too. What I found too is that if you don't treat the big parasites and the little parasites, that it's really hard to clear the fungus ongoing, the candida. So you could find that you're just clearing and clearing and treating yeast and it flares up and then you treat it again and it flares up again, you treat it again, and it just goes on and on and on. 
if you have these large parasites in you. So it's really important to be treating biofilm and the big parasites because remember these big parasites, they carry their own microbes in their body. They carry heavy metals and they carry fungus and bacteria and viruses and all kinds of nasty things. So their own small parasites, I'm sure. That's why we need to clear them for sure. So we all have MS, but different due to many different individual infections. So Debbie, the, in, the infections are very similar, um, for sure parasites and for sure fungus and for sure bacteria and viruses could be active, but they're not really what's causing it that we see that, that we've seen with our students. And so we just might have different levels and yes, there can be different species. So there's lots of different types of fungus. So it may not just be candida. It could be aspergillus. It could be mold, right? And there's, there's different types of, there could be, you know, hookworms. There could be liver flukes. There can be roundworms, big and small. And we can have them in our gallbladder. They move into different, into our, all over, into different organs. So yes, varying degrees of different general generally the same groups but varying degrees so do you have any comments regarding yeast and ms yes it really janet it is a really big part of ms and it's something that we need to treat and this is where you know we have there's several factors involved number one for chronic people that have chronic disease we've had the fungus for a long time so it's very well established in our body but we also have to clear those big parasites, otherwise we're not going to get rid of the fungus. And then we also have to look at our environment. If we have a lot of mercury inside of us, it's a breeding ground for, for yeast. If we're exposed to a lot of radiation, so the wireless radiation from our cordless phones and from our routers and our computers, all of these different sources of wireless radiation will make yeast grow up to 600 times faster. So in order to knock it back well, we have to use all, all those different things that we talk about in the live disease free system. So I, you may not have um, treated um, parasites well enough, or, you know, if, if you have worked on yeast only, and then also some people benefit from using something stronger, not just the herbs. But when I first started, I used the nice statin or nice, nice stat, I think it's called. But remember that if you don't get the liquid, all right, the liquid is full of sugar, you get a very low dose, but it would have to be tablets or capsules that are made from given by your doctor. And it has to be a good enough amount. If they give you a tiny little bit, it's not going to really do anything. And even things like Diflucan, which is more systemic, it would knock back the fungus in your body. With that type, um, what you'll notice is that if they just give you a very low dose for a short period of time, it's not going to be enough. So that's why you've got to find somebody. And I know it's frustrating and hard, um, but working with us or working with integrative healthcare providers, you've got to work with somebody who has experience with that so that you know how to deal with these. So um, lots of parasites coming out with the enema. Awesome. So that is really huge. That's what we're seeing with our students. And those are a lot of the pictures that I've shared is that, that that's what we want to do is we want to clear the parasites. And Sheila, do you know if water retention is common with Lyme disease? Could it be hormonal? That's a really big thing. So your body is genetically programmed. It knows how many hormones it's supposed to make. We have to just support your body so that it can just run like a machine. And so when we have a lot of infections, they can produce chemicals that really affect our endocrine system in many ways. They can mimic estrogen. They can suppress certain glands and organs. So that's what we treat. And the water retention, all of it's connected. You just do the same things as far as, you know, Supporting the body with nutrition, treating those infections, getting toxins down in your environment, and you'll find you're not retain, retaining water at all. It's all interconnected. So Benjamin, could the leftover toxins our livers aren't taking care of be giving us symptoms that we're blaming? Yes, absolutely. 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 That's the absolute truth. And, and remember, too, that when you have these, and it's interesting because there are people that have these baclofen pumps right into their central nervous system, and that is decreasing this spasticity. So 
they know that something's going on in the central nervous system. They just think it's our B cells and our T cells and they're just trying to wipe them out. But no, it's our, it's those parasitic worms and it's fungus. Go back and watch my videos. I've shared just a very recent one about brand new research out of Spain, Madrid, where they're finding fungus growing in the brain cells themselves, in the nucleus of the brain cells of people with MS. That is not a good thing. And they're finding, and Dr. Alan McDonald, as I mentioned, found all those nematodes present. And the significant thing, if you haven't met me before about those nematodes, is that for about 100 years, they've known that when these nematodes, these little parasitic worms, get inside the central nervous system of domestic animals, that's dogs, cats, horses, uh, cattle, etc., they cause symptoms identical to multiple sclerosis. The spasticity, the paralysis, the numbness, the loss of balance, the visual problems, all of those symptoms, they find them in animals that are infected with nematodes in the central nervous system. So not all of our symptoms are caused by the nematodes in the central nervous system. Some symptoms are caused by the fungus, some would be caused by these large parasitic worms. And then if you have the large parasitic worms, it's suppressing your immune system so that your immune system, you know, it's producing all those antihistamines. This is just one little insight today. All those antihistamines suppress your immune system, less eosinophils, which are the soldiers that kill parasites. So then you have your immune system is not dealing with the infection. There are many ways that these infections cause immune dysfunction. And I share them on different calls. Could nettle tea help because it is an antihistamine? I don't think that would be enough, Jackie. I think that you need something stronger. When you're dealing with these worms and the true infestation that we're seeing with multiple sclerosis, it's so much that it, you know, it would be nice if you just don't have any chronic disease and maybe you have a little hay fever. That is also from infections. But it's not going to be enough to get you out of the danger zone with multiple sclerosis. You are so very welcome, Jeanette. I'm so happy. I just want this word to get, I want this to get out. It's super exciting. So, hi, Pam. What is a good example of an antiparasitic drug? So, you have to work with somebody. What I advise, like, I teach people how to find healthcare providers that actually um, know how to do energy testing proper. So they'll actually have the antiparasitic drugs in their office and they will test people and say, that's the only way we can do it, right? We can't, they're not going to pick them up with tests. So they will find which ones work. And then it's really important to understand that the days of popping a pill and getting better are over. With multiple sclerosis, it takes strategy. The students I'm working with, they're layering things together. So they might be doing an antiparasitic drug, but they are also hitting with different types of oxygen therapies. And there's many different types of killing because by the time you have chronic disease, you've got a lot of different infections and also the biofilm. So these microbes will hide under these slimy coats. So you can treat with different types of antiparasitic drugs and you feel better. And then a month or two later, you're sick again because they've come out of the hiding and they're starting to reinfect you. So it takes months to treat them. Some people can be, you know, well on their way with symptom free and in three to six months, etc. But it does take months to treat these infections. And it, you need to work with someone if this is your life, right? So you've got to find somebody who understands this, because, you know, it can happen really fast. And I'm talking months versus years to stop the progression and to have a lot of recovery. I can never promise full recovery, but I can tell you that we're seeing in our students a lot, of, a lot more recovery than they thought they could have when they treat the infections well enough. All right, and so remember that you, know, you need to find somebody who, and we help you with that, is that you have to give them the research. You have to give them the protocols. And if they can test you, and then we work together as a team to you know, up this, decrease that, and that's where people get the quickest results. All right, I'm going to see. So if you're at a place, I'll just see if there's anything else. So if you are at a place where you have been researching for a long time and maybe you've been working with integrative doctors and you, you're tired of it, you're just like, this is old. I want to get on with my life. I want to stop this disease. I don't want to spend another 
year or two or three years trying to figure this out on my own. So if you're in that position, then I would really encourage you to join me on Wednesday next week. That would be, I believe it's September the 12th, uh, whatever next Wednesday is. And I will be hosting my live ma masterclass training, which is called How to Recover from Multiple Sclerosis Naturally. And then from there, if you're ready, if you're the kind of person, and you know what, honestly, if you're ready before then, reach out to us, email us at info at livediseasefree.com and we'll get you some information. But we have a class that's just starting and we're super excited. We've got a few people, quite a few people that have joined already that are getting a head start on everyone else. And they're on sharing questions here on this video and I'm super excited for them because Christmas is gonna be such an amazing time for them. It's gonna be, you know, whether they're very close to being symptom free or well on their way, they will be confident, they will have had enough success that they will really understand what they're doing and it's gonna be life changing. That's all I can say is if you're ready to go to work, if you're ready to roll up your sleeves and to take back your life, we'd love, I would love to support you. So make sure to, um, there will be a link in this video, in the feed, and it is a link to register for my masterclass training. This is the last one for the year. It will be live. I will be answering questions on that call also. And I will be sharing a lot of insights that we've learned from a lot of the students. And you're going to hear stories of people. It will bring tears to your eyes, the successes that they've had. And it's not just them recovering, but we have one wellness champion who's been, I could see her name here listening on this video, that she was also able to reverse the MS, but she was also able to reverse her infertility and to be able to get pregnant and to have a little baby girl. So that's our first wellness champion baby. So yeah, it's really exciting. So I'm excited to see you on Wednesday next week at five o'clock Pacific. Just put your name and email, just click on the link, put your name and email in. You'll get all the details to join us. Make sure to get on five or 10 minutes early because the lines will fill up. We usually have hundreds, like, you know, anywhere between 1500 to 2000 people registering for that. So make sure that you join on the call early. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go and I will continue to advocate for you and I will continue to research. And remember, you don't have to live like this. There is a better way. Make sure to reach out to us. Take care and bye-bye for now.